Good morning. Pastor Kevin Hobbs. Uh, you guys remember me? I came here before. <laughs> that we're here before. So you guys remember me. Uh, it's good to be back. Uh, just a quick thing before I get right into the Bible study. We've had the ministry open now for a month, and it's been doing very well. Uh, we have about uh, 50 people, 50 to 60 people every week. So it's, it's been doing really well. Uh, the people are really yearning for the truth of God's word. Amen. And that's most important. And they're being spiritually edified. So uh, that is doing good. Uh, I'd like to thank Pastor Ron Thompson. Uh, we've been in contact ever since uh, we met. At one time, we've been in contact over these weeks. Uh, he's really been giving me some good advice on on the ministry and on the church, so I really appreciate that. I uh, just got a chance to meet his wife today, uh, so good meeting you. Uh, I think she was home cooking the last time. I put you guys had family in when I came the last time, so uh, good to meet her. And uh, thank God for my co-pastor, uh, Pastor George L. Page. He's here with me. Uh, and my wife and his wife are out in the car still ready. <laughs> so they'll be here shortly. Uh, but I want to get started. Uh, I know you guys are going through, Pastor Ron said he was going through the Ephesians study. And I wanted to do something. I was trying to think of what I was going to do. Uh, and I, 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 uh, God put it in my spirit. I wanted to talk about the, the, mir the first miracle is what defines a person's ministry. So I wanted to break down the first miracle of Jesus Christ, of Peter, the apostle for the Jews, and also of Paul, the apostle for us Gentiles today. And I want to give you the importance of their ministries uh, and the first miracles that they perform and how it dictates what their ministry was going to be. Amen. So uh, let's start off in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you now. We come to you giving you thanks. We thank you for who you are. Father God, we thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. We thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for our sins. Father God, we just thank you for, uh, for keeping us and Father God, touching us. Father God, I ask right now that you renew our minds, O oh God. Transform us by the renewing of our minds, Father God. Help us to live holy and acceptable, Father God. We ask right now that you give us all spiritual enlightenment. Open our eyes of understanding, O oh God, that we may know the truth of your word and that we may live according to your will. Father God, I pray right now that you just continue to bless to touch and help send forth your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 So we'll start off in the book of John, uh, ch uh, chapter number two. The book of John, chapter number two. And this is this is Jesus' first ministry, his earthly ministry. Uh, the Gospels, as we know, talk about God's earthly, uh, Jesus' earthly ministry. And as we see in uh, go through this, we're going to see how this really marks his uh, ministry. We're going to understand how this really marks his ministry, and, uh, and we'll go through it like that. So John chapter number 2, starting at the first verse, and it reads, In the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. His mother said unto the servants, Whatsoever he said unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, Draw out now and bear it and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and said unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. Verse 11, This, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Now, as we look at that first verse, uh, there's a significance, and uh, the numbers really have a big part in the word of God. And uh, it says that the, uh, the third day, and what's significant about the third day to us as believers in the body of Christ? We know that the third day really is what justifies us. Because on the third day, he what? Rose, rose. again mm -hmm. by justification. So as we see that, we, we, we see those things. And 
Now, and then it says uh, about Mary. Now, as we look at Mary, Mary was Jesus' mother, but Mary, her name means rebellion, right? In scripture, Mary's name means rebellion. And she really is a type of Israel. She's a type of Israel. And it's funny how Jesus Christ goes through Mary because Jesus Christ went through the lineage and the rebelliousness of Israel. And then he, he that, that's what brought forth our Savior. And then it says, and both Jesus was called and his disciples. So all of them, uh, all of them were there. All the disciples were there. Jesus was there. His mother was there. And uh, anybody know what wine represents in Scripture? What wine represents? Holy Spirit. No, not the Holy Spirit, but wine. Whenever they talk about wine in the Scripture, it means joy. It means joy. It represents joy, to have a joy. So as we see this in verse number 3, it says, And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus called unto him. Uh, and I think it's Ecclesiastes 10 and 19 It says that the wine makes us merry Right, so as we see that it's, it's, it's all about the joy there And then verse number 4 It says, Jesus said unto her Woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come Now Jesus Christ was on a time schedule If you look at his life and, and his ministry, everything was on a time schedule He was set to come He was set to teach And he was set to die And everything was on a time schedule and he told his mother there that his hour was not yet come. So he's on this time schedule because he has a job to do, right? Now, verse number five, his mother said unto the servants, whatsoever he said unto you, do it. Now, she knew who her son was, but not in its, not in its entirety of fullness. But she knew that whatever they needed, her son was able to do it for them, right? Now, here we go to the good part. And it says there were set there six water pots of stone. Now the number six in your Bible represents uh, hum humanity. It represents man, the number of the earth, right? On the sixth day, it, it represents that number of the earth. And then it says, uh, after the manner of the purifying of the uh, what, uh, there were set there six water pots of stone. Now six represents the number of man, and the water pots of stone represents Israel's stony heart. Because Israel was always in, dis in unbelief, and they were always re uh, rebellious, and then they rejected their Messiah. So that represents their stony heart. So as I break this down, I want you to see and get the picture of what this is talking about and the significance of Jesus' first ministry. Now it says, uh, and there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or more, two or three furnaces apiece. Now, water in the scripture represents the spirit of God. Water represents the spirit of God and the word of God. And they are both, they're both representative of life, right? They're both representative of life. And the water here is the source of life. Paul says in Ephesians 5 and 26 that the husband is to love his wife just as Christ loved the church and sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of the word, right? So the water represents life here. So what Jesus is going to do, he's going to take these empty stone pots, Israel, and their unbelief, and he's going to fill them with water. He's going to fill them with life, right? He's going to fill them with life. And as we see this, this is what Jesus was sent to do. He was sent to redeem Israel, right? Even in their unbelief, even in their unbelief. And that's why you have an apostate Israel. And as we look at this chart, I always like to use the chart. And as we look at this, we see we have the little flock, and then we have the rest of apostate Israel, right? So we have apostate Israel who had the stony hearts and unbelief, but Jesus was going to set apart a nation out of that. And this is the symbolism of it in the scripture. He's saying he's going to fill those empty water pots with water. He's going to give them life because that, that's what Jesus was sent to do. He was sent to, to Israel so they could be the channel of blessing for all of the other all the other nations right and then it says uh, verse 7 he, Jesus said unto them fill the water pots with water and they filled them up to the brim and he said draw out now and bear them to the governor and if you drop down to verse 10 it says he said uh, he said unto him every man at the beginning does set forth good wine and which men have well drunk then that which is worse but thou has kept the good wine until now you ever heard the saying saving the best for last you know, and that's what this represents. Jesus takes those human empty vessels and he fills them with water. That's those, those stony vessels in unbelief, and he fills them with water. He's gonna give them the he's gonna give them life. He fills them with his word. He fills them with his spirit, 
and he brings forth the joy of their kingdom, right? See, because the wine represents the joy, so he turned the water, which is life, into wine because he's going to fill them with his spirit, and then that's going to transform them into that joy and the joy of their kingdom. And this is just a symbolism of Jesus Christ taking Israel into their kingdom if they are to believe on him, right? Because they had to first believe that he is, that he was the Messiah. So as we see this, the marriage represents the kingdom. The marriage, this, they were at a marriage. This represents the kingdom, right? So Jesus was supposed to go, to, he's going to take them into the kingdom, and he's going to save the best for last. Because we all know that Israel does not get its blessing of the kingdom until out here. So it was like a foreshadowing of things to come. But what Jesus was showing them here, it's all symbolic here that he was at this marriage feast. He's going to fill them with his words, fill them with his spirit. And at that time, the nation of Israel would get their blessings in the end. That's why they're going to save the best for last. And that's all symbolic of this marriage that we have here. So as we see that Jesus was in his earthly ministry, he was on a time schedule, right? He was on a time schedule. And the first thing he was to do in his earthly ministry was to feel Israel. He was to let them know, I am the Messiah, believe on me. You trusted the prophets, you trusted all these people out here, but now I'm come to redeem you. But we all know they rejected him, right? And so they won't get their blessing until out here. And that's representative of that, because God is gonna fill them with water, he's gonna give them joy when they come into this kingdom, right? Because we know that Israel is gonna be the channel of blessing out here. But for us today in the body of Christ, we know and understand that these things out here are going to happen when we're already gone. All right? Thank God for his grace. Amen. Now, if you go with me to Acts chapter number 3, we're going to get into Peter's first miracle. And as we know, Peter was the uh, 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 apostle because Jesus Christ said him, set him out in Matthew 16. And he told him, who do men say that I am? And he said, some say Elias, but he said, no, who do you say that I am? And uh, he said, thou art the Christ. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood have not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. So we understand that Peter had the ability to do things on his own that the rest of the apostles had to do by two or three. Because remember, Jesus always sent them out by two and three, right? And he says, uh, when two or three of you are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. They ne always needed two or three. Two in the scripture represents a number of witness, right? So they always needed a witness. But Peter could do what they needed two or three for. He could do it by himself because God gave him the keys to heaven and the earth. Whatever he bound in heaven, will, one earth will be bound in heaven. God gave Peter that authority. So as we look at here, uh, uh, Acts chapter number three, verse number one. It says, now Peter and John went up together into the temple uh, at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, laying from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who say Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for arms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement. At wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, Solomon's greatly wondering. Now, anytime you see in the Gospels the uh, or in the book of early book of Acts where it says a certain man. A certain man represents a type of Israel. Anytime, the only time, even when Jesus gave his parables, he always said a certain man or a certain woman. But the only parable that he said someone's name uh, was, was Lazarus, when he gave the parable about Lazarus, because that was an actual account of what happened, right? So as we look at this, we see that this is a certain man. Now this man uh, was lame, meaning he couldn't walk from birth. He couldn't walk, he couldn't do anything. He was lame, right? He, he was a type of Israel and how 
uh, Israel cannot or they did not have the strength to walk in God's law. You see, they were lame in the fact that all back here, when God, God gave the promise to Abraham and then he fortified that promise with the law. And Israel for 1,500 years, as we know, they could not keep the law. So they didn't have the strength to walk in that law like they should have, right? So this, this certain man here represents a type of Israel that did not have the strength to do it, right? They were lame from the, uh, from, this man was lame from his mother's womb, and, and the mother being Jerusalem, the law, right? As we know in, in the book of Zechariah, when Jesus Christ comes back to set foot on the Mount of Olives, we understand that he's going to set foot in Jerusalem, right? So, so that, that represents that law, and that's... Uh, Paul even says that in Galatians 4 and 26 uh, that the law is the mother of us all. Uh, uh, Jerusalem is the mother of us all, right? So as, as we understand this, we see that they could not walk in God's law, so, so they're going to have to look to Peter and John, right? They're going to have to look to Peter and John because out here in the, during this tribulation period, now God didn't appoint us to wrath, so we won't be there. But out here, they're going to have to look through to Peter and John for their strength. And that's what this is going to represent. Because we understand uh, that the books of Hebrews and Revelation, first of all, the book of Hebrews, God wrote it. So God says, listen, look at me. During this tribulation, you're going to have to look at me. Right? And then the next books he wrote are first, uh, uh, James, uh, John, uh, first, uh, first and second Peter, first, second, third John. The, the book of Revelation is written by John. So they're going to have to look to these apostles in order for their strength out here. Right? And that's what this that's what this is gonna represent. Because this has to be uh they're gonna have to understand the power of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus raised up apostles over here, so that when he leaves, he can send them out and form that little flock. Right? That's what they're gonna do. And Jesus also says that they will rule, sit on twelve thrones, uh, and judge the twelve tribes of Israel. So as we see this, we're going to understand that Peter and John, they're all going to be relevant out here in this tribulation. That's why God wrote the books, your books and your Bible from Hebrews to Revelation. That's why we cannot apply this to us today, but we can learn from it because we won't be out here. So we won't need to lean on Peter and John because as we get to Paul's miracle next, we're going to see that Paul is going to walk us into, into the, the heavenly places, right? If we focus on his doctrine which is about Jesus Christ. Now, this is the first recorded miracle of Peter in, in Scripture. The, the Jesus turned the water into wine. That's the first recorded miracle of, of Jesus in Scripture. And this, this is what defines a person's ministry. Now, as we go to that, uh, what is that, the second verse, it says, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful. Now, why is this gate called beautiful? Have you ever, have you ever asked yourself that? The gate beautiful has to do with the kingdom. It's representative of this kingdom that they're going to get because it's going to be beautiful, right? And we, we always read about the, the mansions filled with gold and all those things. And, you know, we think that's for us because we don't write to divide the word of truth, right? So a, a, as we see those things, this beautiful gate is a picture of Israel coming into that beautiful city. Go with me to Psalms chapter number 48. Psalms 48, verses 1 and 2. This is a prophetic psalm. Psalms 48, verses 1 and 2. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of, ho of His holiness, Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great of the great king. So as we see that on your way back to Acts, go to Isaiah 52. Verse 1. Isaiah 52, verse 1. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy what? Beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for henceforth there shall no more come unto thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Drop down to verse 7. <coughs> How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publishes peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publishes salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. 
So as we see this issue of the beautiful gate, the, the lame man who was representative of Israel that was weak in God's law was sitting at the gate of this kingdom. It reminds me of the story of the two thieves that were on the cross with Jesus. One of them was on the gateway of hell and went to heaven. The other was on the gateway of heaven and went to hell. He was sitting at the gate. He was lame and that they could not take themselves in. The lame man in this text, he could not walk himself inside the gates. So they always set him out right at the gate to ask for alms, right? So as we see that, it's, it's representative of this beautiful gate. Now, as we go to verse 3, it says, Who's saying Peter and John about to go into the kingdom? Now, it's a type of Israel because they're beggars under that law. Notice how he's sitting there begging for alms, right? They're beggars under that, under that law because the law is weak and beggarly because of Israel's sin, right? That's why Paul says in, to the Galatians, why put yourself under the weak and beggarly elements of the law? Why be entangled again in the yoke of bondage? And even when we try to teach people to live under these laws, that's what we do. We put people under the weak and uh, beggarly elements of the law. And that's what, that's what he, this, this man is representative of, a type of Israel under that law and that he could not do for himself what Christ is going to be able to do for them. Right? So that's what we see. They're destitute and they're lame under that law. And it's a representative of that. And it says, they go about to the temple, acts of alms. Verse 4, and Peter fastening his eyes up, upon him with John said, look on us. See, this is prophetic because during this tribulation, they're going to have to look upon the apostles and their doctrine because they won't be able to go to uh, Romans 2, 5, Amen in this period over here. It won't help them because the dispensation of grace will be ended. So God is going to bring back the law. He's going to bring back those things that they're going to have to do in order to walk into that beautiful gate, that beautiful city, which is called their kingdom. So they're going to have to look upon them uh, to, to see that because all of the books from Hebrews to Revelation, Peter and John really wrote most of them. And then James, uh, not the apostle, but Jesus' brother James wrote, wrote the book of James. So they're going to have to look to the apostles to understand their doctrine, right? Go back to uh, Acts chapter number 2, uh, I believe it's 42. Acts 2 and 42, go back one book. Yeah, Acts 2 and 42. It says they continue steadfastly in what? The apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in uh, breaking of bread and in prayers. In order for the Jews to enter into the kingdom, they're going to have to continue to steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Because you got to think, during this tribulation period, it's not going to be like, you know, somebody, you know, cuts you off in the street out here and you get angry. No, it's going to be way worse than that out here. So they're going to need some type of strength. They're going to be lame. And the fact that they're not going to be able to keep all these laws, they couldn't do it then. But then if they, if they hold steadfastly to the apostles' doctrine, they're going to be able to enter the kingdom where God says he will put his law in their hearts to where they won't sin against them again. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's, that's what this, this represents. Go back to uh, Acts chapter number 3. And as we look at, as we look, go down to uh, verse 6, Peter said, uh, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give thee in the name of the Lord Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. See, a lot of times what people need today, they don't need money. They need guidance. They need something that's going to help them out. Because uh, just given my, my background of playing ball and then being an accountant, there are a lot of people that ask you for money, but they don't really need the money because next week they're going to ask you, for, ask you again. But what they need is some type of guidance on how to manage the money. That's what they need. So as we see this, he was asking for alms, but that's not what he needed. See, because he didn't understand in order to get to this kingdom, he don't need the silver and gold. He needs Jesus Christ. And that is what healed him. You see that? It's not the silver and gold. When people are all on TV, oh, if you uh, buy this prayer cloth and this miracle water, it's going to... Get you into that that is a bunch of nonsense right because none of that stuff is, is, is relevant today that's a bunch of nonsense all it is is something to get your money right but all this guy needed was jesus christ he didn't need silver and gold right peter go uh peter says silver and gold have i done so matter of fact i may start using this scripture money i have none <laughs> but such as i have <laughs> i give to thee right so that's what we can start telling people who ask us for that right yeah, we get, we're backed up by scripture because it says it right here. 
But 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 seriously, that but that's what Peter was saying. I don't have anything that's going to help you monetarily or physically. I have something that's going to help you eternally. Mm -hmm. And see that that's the key. Uh, verse number <laughs> verse number seven. It says he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. Now the right hand is a position of strength and authority. That's what the right hand symbolizes. And then it says uh, he lifted him up and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Now, as we look at this, it says immediately his ankle bones received strength. Uh, as we take a look at this, healings in the Bible were always, always, uh, uh, immediately. They were always right now. You know, they're always right now. That's why we understand in this dispensation of grace, God didn't promise you and I healing. See, because in healing, in Israel's program of prophecy, healing was simultaneous with the forgiveness of sins. When Jesus came and healed, most of the time he always said, your sins are forgiven. Right? It's simultaneous with...